Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. I know it's been a while, so this isn't much of a Bible teaching as it is just an update on the ministry. A more in-depth explanation why I stepped down and what's going on in my life right now that's affecting my ability to be in, back in the ministry full-time, part-time. Now we're all part of the Ministry of Reconciliation. So, I had a lot of, when I put out some of those videos, I had brothers and sisters in Christ saying, praying for you and your, and your wife, and I talked to some brothers in Christ, and they encouraged me to do this video. So, I want to quote a couple of verses to explain why. I'm just going to do a quick video explaining what happened in my life recently, and just drop it like that and just be done with it but someone said that it'd be a great video to do to warn the brothers and sisters in Christ out there that what happened to me doesn't happen to you so if you want to turn to Acts 20 28 there's gonna be scripture always scripture this is the foundation of my life the King James Bible I'm always going to be turning to it Acts 20 28 Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw, draw away disciples after them, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Okay. This video I'm doing and I'm making for the brethren out there is to warn you with tears even. What I went through, I don't wish upon anybody. Um, just a, an outline. My wife is no longer with me and she's no longer my wife. And I'm going to explain everything, and I owe an apology. I apologize to God first, and now I owe the brethren an apology. So, and I'm warning you, night and day with tears, what I went through. Uh, bottom line, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I married a false convert. And, like I said, I want to get ahead of myself. Bottom line, I, I want to make this video, and the whole point of this video is pointing out my errors. But the reason I'm going into a little bit more detail than I wanted to is because I want to explain to you why I'm warning you night and day with tears. Why God warns us that um, we're not to fellowship with the lost world, but we're not to get married to the lost also. And we're not to, you know, be a friend of the world, that kind of thing. Um, so night and day with tears. I'm going to try to keep it together during this, this video. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the thing done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. I had to throw that in because that verse came to mind, and I'm no, I don't want to take it out of context, but the terror that I went through, and it was terror, um, I want to persuade you not to make the mistake that I made. So let's get into it. Uh, what I went through, um, November to about January is uh, roughly uh, the marriage, how long we were married. Uh, probably a little bit longer than that. Um, I, I'll get into it. When I talked to her, we talked for about six to eight months prior to us uh, getting married. And I talked to her, I was honest, I told her how I live out here, um, what I believe, you know, I believe in the King James Bible is God's perfect written word. I believe in the true gospel of repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and call upon the name of the Lord to save you. Um, I believe in dispensational teaching. I believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ. Um, 
I was honest with her eternal security. I told her I believe in the changed life after salvation as evidence of salvation. I explained my testimony to her. I did a testimony video for the for the brethren to hear. And uh, I chose I told her how much God changed my life. Got movies, TV shows, video games out of my life. There are going to be struggles till the day I die. I mean, you can't go anywhere. Uh, a good example is is every once in a while I try to block them. But every once in a while, I'll get an email saying that I had some websites I was a part of signed up on that you could download computer games. And every once in a while, come on saying, hey, we've got games, we got percentages off, we got sales on these games and everything. And it's a temptation. Uh, you walk in town and you see uh, the movies, the magazines of all the stars, the famous actors. I mean, things start coming back in your head. Something can happen in your life that happened on a movie. and it's a struggle, it's a temptation. Um, I told her how I live and I told her that if we got married I explained how I wanted us to live and I wanted it to be based off the King James Bible. This is our foundation. I wanted our home to be a godly home. Okay. I listened to her testimony. I listened to her talk and she's like, yeah I agree and she would quote scripture. Um, she would uh, say, yeah I believe in all that stuff. Okay. So, first month after we got married, everything was great. Uh, we did things together. The house got kind of rearranged. Um, gosh, uh, I'm not one for, how do you call it, uh, everything has to be fashionably in order, you know. Everything, I think most of my paintings, not a single one of them was level. <laughs> but, um, Everything seemed to go good. You know, we'd read the Bible every day, and we'd listen to Bible studies. Uh, she had her positive addictions, her hobbies. Uh, she loved gardening, and she loved arts and crafts. And I loved the Word of God, and I loved the outdoors and everything. So, just to be brunt and just sum it all right up. Bottom line, come to find out, She's an alcoholic and a drug addict. Now I have to throw that out there right away. So I was struggling with my wife and with my home, trying to keep my home a godly home and trying to be there for my wife. And that's why I made that video and I had to step down from the ministry. My house wasn't in order. Everything seemed to be falling apart. My struggles with uh, temptation was, you know, the temptation to go hide from my problems, like people do, the world does. Hide from your problems with me would be, would be in movies, TV shows, and video games. For her, evidently alcohol, uh, drugs, uh, could be anything for different people where they like to go hide and not deal with what's going on. So I was doing my best to deal with what's going on. I couldn't focus on Bible teachings, my studies. I couldn't do any of that. I had to step down from the ministry. So, um, things that I had to go through, and like I said, this is going to be the terror part. By the, the terror of the Lord we persuade men, but this terror about what I went through, I know that part up there is talking about salvation. Um, and in this life, the things that we've gone through, the chastening of the Lord and everything, God letting us go through experiences because we make mistakes. Sometimes we don't make mistakes and we go through experiences. I went through this experience because I made a mistake. And I'm going to talk about that as we go along. But I want to explain what I was going through. I didn't really want to go into it. I'm still not going to go into it into big detail. But I want you to know the terror that I was going through. Right. Now, let's go. First one is... Uh, after the month, I guess, because she was trying to hide the addictions, um, ev evidently she got to the point where she couldn't go without it. And she'd get the keys to my truck, jump in my truck, and this is in the evenings, and she'd take off into town, because I live out in the mountainside. She'd take off into town, and she wouldn't come back to the next morning. And she'd come back hungover sometimes. And she had this thing where she had a hard time sleeping. She was up a lot. So there was times where she came back where it still seemed like she was a little buzzed still. So 
I was dealing with that, and at first, because of my love for her, I'd have panic attacks going, is she okay? I'd tell her not to go, she wouldn't listen. Jump in the truck, take off. Okay. She called one night, um, and she was desperate. She called one night, she was scared. Uh, there's a Fred Myers by here, she was in the bathroom at Fred Myers saying there was some strange man in, in the truck, in our vehicle. And I was like, she had to have been drunk to not know who he was, or high. Uh, she got into smoking weed, and to not know who he was. And it's like, we only own one vehicle, and you only need to own one vehicle. I'm retired, and she was supposed to be a keeper at home. But there was nothing I can do, and this is things I had to put up with, her disappearing all night and going into town. Come to find out, she was hanging out with the, the homeless and people on the streets. And she would flirt with guys to get alcohol, to get cigarettes, to get weed, whatever. Um, I got, what do you call it? Um, I just don't know the right words sometimes. It's just, what I went through was just a nightmare. Um, she would put me down to the point where she'd get me to do things I knew I shouldn't do. And I'm not talking about bad, bad things. I'm talking about she got me to drive her into town one night because I, I found out she was getting behind the wheel of the truck drunk. And before that, I couldn't get her on, she wouldn't get on my insurance. So she's an uninsured driver getting behind the wheel of the truck after drinking alcohol. I believe she was intoxicated. She denies it. She wasn't that intoxicated. That's what alcoholics do. And I had to take the keys away from her. So one night she really lit into me, um, guilt tripping, there's a good word, and making me out, just basically pushing me to drive her into town. And I gave in and I drove her up the top of the hill to the mailbox and then I stopped and said, Lord, this isn't right. I shouldn't take her. She put on a big scene, was screaming, jumping out of the truck, and saying she's taking off. And around here we have bears, we have mountain lions, and it's late at night. And I gave in and said, get in the car. So I took her into one of the gas stations so she could, I, we're broke. I wouldn't give her money for alcohol. I wouldn't give her money for cigarettes. And she flirted with some guy. She, that bought her some cigarettes, got her some drinks, uh, and she went around behind the gas station. I'm sitting there, the terror of the Lord, I'm sitting there in my truck with the magnets on it saying that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And here's my wife getting in there, flirting with other men, getting cigarettes, going around to the backside, and sitting there smoking and, and drinking whatever it was she was drinking. And I waited, and I waited, and it got to the point where I must have been sitting there for an hour just terrified, praying, saying, Lord, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And I walk around, and gosh, like I said, I didn't want to go into too much detail, but there was a guy that bought her the stuff. He's sitting there, and... As soon as I told her that's my wife, he jumped about 50 feet away from her. He was flirting with her and, oh, I'm not doing anything, I'm not doing anything. And I tried talking her into coming home. Let's go home. It's time to go home. And after all of that, she tried preaching the gospel. And we'll get to that, the problem I was struggling with her. So she was disappearing at night, going into town and not coming back to the next morning. And she'd come back hungover or she'd come back still a little buzzed or drunk. Okay, she'd hang out with the lost. She got along with the lost world. And she really loved hanging out with them and drinking and smoking. Okay, getting behind the wheel of the truck drunk. I took the keys away. That didn't do much good because within a few weeks, she really went through the whole house and found my spares and stole my spares. And she was sneaking into town. I already knew about it, but there's nothing I can do. And I'm like, Lord, what do I do? She's uninsured, and she's getting behind the wheel drunk. Okay. She'd get drunk. She'd bring home alcohol and stash it in the house. And she would call people late at night. 
between 12 and 4 in the morning, she'd be calling family members and friends, and I'd get phone calls during the day from her family members yelling at me, chewing me out, saying I need to tell her to stop calling them at that time of the night. Okay. When I took the keys away from her at first, and like I said, the whole point of me telling this is not for me to complain or whine. I'm going to get to it. Um, where I screwed up and my warning to you, brothers and sisters in Christ, but I just want you to know the terror that I went through. Okay? I want you to know that the reason I'm warning you guys not to make the mistake I did. Okay? I talked to her, but I didn't delve in deeper like I should have. God didn't leave me hanging. So after I went through this, I looked back and said, okay, God showed me this beforehand. Sometimes they'll make that noise if there's a nest nearby, they'll make a lot of noise. So, hopefully they'll stop. Um, so I'm hoping to warn you about this stuff, okay? A big thing that she did too is I lost my testimony a lot with my neighbors. Uh, this is the damage from my mistake, from me screwing up. And... A lot of the birds are coming out. The mistake that I made, she would leave and go roam the neighborhood. She'd roam the neighborhood seeking cigarette, alcohol, and she found a neighbor somewhere uh, that evidently he's growing pot here in Oregon. It's legal, you can grow only so much. Um, found a guy that, was, that had weed, basically. And I'd get called at like two in the morning She's stoned or she's drunk by the neighbor or by herself and it's dark at night. She couldn't see how to get back to the house. I had to get a flashlight and get out there and like I said, we're in bear country and mountain lion country and during the day I have no fear because the Lord doesn't give us a spirit of fear even though my mistake that I went through I definitely had fear because of my screw up. And I'd have to go get her at night. I'd lay there panicking, wondering when she's going to call, when she's coming home. Okay. Now, she started getting drunk around the house. Like I said, something that slowly started falling downhill and it started going downhill great. She started hiding alcohol. She got money from family members and friends so she could drive into town and get alcohol. And like I said, she stole my keys after I took them away because I didn't want her behind the wheel of the truck drunk. And she it got so bad that I had to I was basically living out of the office room because she was listening she brought in worldly music she brought Lady Gaga into our home and she was getting drunk blasting the music she was just getting out of control very much getting out of control and I I've never had to deal with this up close and personal. And the first mistake I made is I tried talking to her while she was drunk. I tried pleading with her. I tried uh, quoting scripture to her, offering, let's pray, let's do this, let's do that, and realizing that at one point she's just really drunk. And I was desperate. And I had to learn that I couldn't talk to her when she was drunk. When I tried talking to her when she was drunk, Bible, and we'll get to that, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, uh, she would mock God's word, and she would mock Jesus when she was drunk. Uh, when she's high, it almost looked like she was, I've never been around someone who's high before. Um, it was like a deer in the headlights look. It was almost like she was, uh, gosh, Brother Brian did a great study on devil possession in the eyes, and it just looked like she was devil possessed. I mean, it was like, she wasn't even there. She was walking around, she was doing things, but it was like she wasn't even there. Uh, gosh, panic attacks. Gosh. I, um, it got to the point where she would get verbally abusive, uh, guilt tripping, manipulation, uh, to the point where she just got verbally abusive and that verbal abusiveness turned into physical abusiveness and she got physically abusive with me 
Um, it got to the point where I had to barricade myself in the office several times. And once again, I'm trying not to go into too much depth, but I want you to know the terror that I went through laying there in the office room, panicking, knowing that she's drunk, every footstep across the house, is she coming to bang down the door? Is she coming to start a fight? Begging the Lord to forgive me, asking Him to save me, on my knees crying, and every night, in two and a half months, I lost 60 pounds. I wasn't working out, okay? I, I think I was eating, but I wasn't hardly eating. I was having the panic attacks every night. It was an utter nightmare. Okay. Uh, she would threaten to leave me, and she packed everything up once because she met somebody in town. She claimed it was a girl, but I don't know who it was, and I don't know what she was doing in town to get people to buy her the alcohol and the weed and the cigarettes. And like I said, it's just a nightmare I don't wish on anybody. And it's all because I didn't do, and I'm going to go through the list of the warnings, to warn the brethren how to avoid what I went through, the mistake I made marrying a lost woman. She had all the right words to say, she had intellectual belief, but she, in the end she was just religious. And the Bible didn't mean squat when it came to her sin and how she wanted to live. Mm -hmm. She didn't care about her husband, she didn't care about anything. And yes, I know, and we'll get to that. Let's see. Verbal abuse, physical abuse. If she kicked down the door several times to the point where she almost broke the door. Um, a big thing, like I said, family members. I tried to hide it from family members. I kept like a recluse. I had to step down from the ministry. Those who were following the ministry. Yeah, it's hot out here. There's you some shade. The ministry realized that I hadn't been talking. I used to talk underneath the comment section under Brother Brian's videos, JT's videos. Um, I'd put scripture to the lost, or link the Bible version issue to the lost. I'd talk with people, um, answer some questions here and there. And for that whole time period, I was like gone. Um, but I, I still think I was the biggest fool in the world. She said she was getting it under control. This before things got really, really, really bad. But, um, gosh. Like I said, family found out. Uh, they were shocked and appalled and was like hardly, like, it just was unacceptable, her behavior. I put hiding alcohol in the house. And then, like I said, getting drunk a lot. And here's the big thing. The thing that really got to me, that, like I said, with the neighbors ruining my testimony with the neighbors, ruining my testimony with people in town, um, because of my mistake, my testimony. You can ruin your testimony with people when you make mistakes. Uh, the biggest thing that hurt the testimony is she's going around claiming to be a Bible-believing Christian, and she's getting drunk, she's getting high, and when she gets drunk and gets high, that's when she decides, I'm going to preach the gospel to people. And the people look at her and say, is that what a Christian's supposed to be about? And then they look at me thinking, I'm the same way. I'm just like her. Okay. Now, at the very end, she was lying to her family members, and some of her family members were calling me, threatening to call the cops on me like I'm holding her prisoner. I drove her into town when she wanted to during the day. I just wouldn't do it at night. But her greatest time to just go crazy was at night. Child of the night versus child of the day, of the light. Now, I remember that study uh, that a brother in Christ did talking about how, you know, Christians really don't want to do things at night. They want to sleep. If you have a job, you have a job, and you've got to work at night. But for the most part, you're not going to be a night owl. You might have some problems sleeping, and you wake up, and you have to read the Bible, or do a Bible study, or you get trapped into looking at things online, or doing whatever. You get up and try to do some work, so you can't sleep. If you have having problems sleeping, but you're trying. You're not purposely saying, I'm a night owl, and I'm just going to stay up all night and sleep during the day. Um, like I said, unless you got a job. I worked the night shift when I was in the military. 
So she had people calling me, threatening to call the cops. She was calling advocacy groups. Like I was, it just everything was just falling apart. And I tried everything. I tried to get her to sing old hymns with me, but like I said, when she got drunk, next thing I know, she's listening. I have my uh, computer hooked up to the TV. I don't have cable. I don't watch television or movies, but I have the computer hooked up to the TV so I can watch Bible studies. I can do work. I have two little TVs that I was going back and forth from uh, to help do with Bible studies. Uh, I can watch a study and then look up things when I had ideas. Uh, I could be typing up a study and then looking up Bible verses on the other screen. Well, she decided to put music videos on there and listen to them as loud as she could. And I had to go in there several times and ask her to turn it down. And then when she got really out of control, I just started hiding in my office. I was a prisoner in my own home, basically. I couldn't defend myself because this is America. I hope that the sisters in Christ and brothers in Christ out there can understand that in the sense that if I tried to defend myself and she got hurt, she'd call the cops and I can go to prison. Not prison, but I'd go to jail. Um, even if they find out later I'm innocent, at the moment I'm guilty until proven innocent. So that's why I locked myself in there. It's not that I was being a coward. I just didn't know what to do with that situation. Okay. Like I said, she was leaving bruises on me. And it just, it was getting really out of control. In the end, I sent her away to be with her family. I tried to do it with respect. I tried to do it in a good way. And her mother said that she could come stay with her for a little bit. And it was getting so unhealthy and dangerous for us to be under the same roof together. So I tried to get her to go stay with, she wanted to anyway. I tried to get her to go stay with her mom for a little bit. And her mom was like, okay, she knew what was going on. She can come stay with me for a little bit. But she had terms, she had rules, okay. You come stay with me, you don't go hang out with your friends and get drunk and come back drunk or high. You stay with me. You don't go, you don't leave the house going house to house like she does here and getting drunk and getting high. You stay there, you get your heart right with the Lord and you get clean. And you try to fix your marriage. You try to make it so we can live under the same roof again. Okay. Her, uh, at first she was all for it, I'm going to go stay with my mom. Then her mom said, these are the stipulations, these are my rules to help you out, because her home's a godly home. And then she wouldn't go back. I ain't going back, I ain't going back. Uh, her brother and sister, her sister and brother-in-law, uh, at first they wanted me to go with her when they, she was pregnant, she was going to give birth, and we were supposed to go visit her before or after the birth. And after I had to send her back the hard way, uh, back up to her family and everything, they offered to take her in and do the same thing, help her to get clean and everything. The problem is, she didn't think she had a problem. She would justify it. And I wanna, I'm going to break everything down, all the signs that God gave me saying, hey, don't marry this woman. And I was blind to some of it. I was deceived. But God didn't leave me hanging. Looking back, they were there. The signs were there. And I'm going to warn you of what to look for so you don't make the same mistake that I made. Okay. So she turned them down. So she went back home, and within two months of being back, because I talked to her a couple times, and within two months of being back, she remarried. Okay, I didn't put her away, I didn't divorce her. I was still wearing my wedding ring, I was still talking to some of her family, and I was hoping that she would choose. It just got to the point where I don't think, she, I, I still don't believe she's saved. It just got to that point because there was no sorrow for sinning against God. She's bringing sin and wickedness in my home. It's like everything she told me before we got married was a lie. And we'll get into the PWCs. You, those are the most people that you really, really, really got to watch out for. PWCs, and I'll explain what that is in a little bit. But things that we struggle with in our marriage. The one thing I left out here is when I stepped down from the marriage, uh, when I stepped down from the ministry, both start with an M, the ministry, 
She was happy. She was happy. I'm happy. I'm, and then she threatened me if I tried to get back in the ministry. You need to deal with your wife. And, and I'm more important. And, and she was happy. And, and these all these signs are like, how can somebody with the Holy Spirit in them be happy that she destroyed her husband's ability to be used of God in the ministry the way I was? I'm not patting myself on the back. I am a sinner saved by grace. And I make mistakes. But how can you be happy about that? So we're going to get into that. So things I struggle with, her being an alcoholic, her addiction to alcohol, her addiction to weed and cigarettes, drug addiction. Um, she was a friend of the world. She'd go disappear at night, go into town, not come back to the next morning, and she's hanging out with the lost world, and the lost world loves her and thinks she's the coolest thing going. Okay, she's a love. she loves the world. Love not the world. And we'll get to that. Uh, I, I realized there towards the end that Halfway through, actually, but towards the end, it was an absolute, without a shadow of a doubt, I was dealing with a false comfort. And there's no way we were ever going to get along with her living the way she wanted to live. I wouldn't have anything to do with it. She'd get mad at me. You don't spend time with me. Well, when she wasn't drinking, she wasn't smoking, she wasn't high, she wasn't listening to satanic style music. I spent time with her when she was doing her gardening. I spent time with her watching Bible studies when she was doing arts and crafts, I tried to take her to the beach. I tried to get her to go for walks with me. I did try to spend time with her. I just wouldn't condone those sins, and I didn't want to be around her in those sins. One thing I left out here is, in the, and I told her this, in the military, I got into drinking. Um, I got into drinking to the point where I got drunk really bad. I, I was an alcoholic. If you get drunk to the point where you, I mean, drink to the point where you get drunk and you're hanging out with the buddies and you're doing that a lot and you think you're having a great time, you can fall into being an alcoholic. I was blessed that I got drunk really bad one time and it opened my eyes. I was still lost. This was, I mean, as a professing Christian, showing that God's laws are written on every man's heart. And God got me out of it, but I didn't want that around me. I don't want to fall back into that. I don't want to get back into drinking. I gave up my world in music. Okay. So, and remember Titus 1.16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. I was dealing with somebody that was false, a convert, that denied Jesus Christ with her actions. She thought she could make up for her sin by uh, handing out gospel tracts and preaching the gospel like she was drunk. It was getting bad. So, uh, warnings on looking for a wife and husband, even with fellowship, but in my situation, warning the brethren. Sometimes people will say young men and women, uh, young Christians. This, this video is to my brothers and sisters in Christ that are single, they're newly saved, or they can been saved for a while. Don't fall in the trap I did, okay? 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. We're to try the spirits. You're supposed to, and we're going to go through a list here of things that you're supposed to really drive home when you're looking for a godly wife or a godly husband. I was so excited. I did a big study on a husband's responsibility and everything. So the first thing, and now I'm going to drive these points home to warn you, brothers and sisters in Christ, and then show how I failed. I failed. Okay. At this point, she committed adultery, claiming she's remarried, and I gave her a writ of divorce, and I'm done with her. I'll pray, I still pray for her sometimes, that God gives her every opportunity to get saved and get that junk out of her life. It's destroying her. But at this point, I can only deal with me, where I screwed up, where I went wrong. Okay. I hate being given absolutes. I'm 40 years old. I don't know if anybody knows, knows that, but I turned 40 in April. I'm 40 years, 40 years old. Uh, what they call middle-aged. Um, so I don't think I'll ever be getting married again. But I want to warn you what I did wrong as a saved. I've been saved five years. I screwed up. Okay. First thing is the testimony. You check their testimony. Okay. Keep asking for their testimony every so often. 
why I say that is you hear it once like I heard it and think, well, everything's great. After we got married and I started seeing these red flags and I started seeing things that didn't make sense, I started asking her about her testimony and next thing you know, her testimony kept changing. Okay? Your testimony is not, when you tell your testimony, it might not be exactly the same, but the key points are going to be the same. When you got saved, how you became broken, okay? Your, what your lost life was like before you got saved, and so on. And the changed life after salvation, okay? Um, let's see, if it changes a lot, like I just said, or it does not line up with Scripture, that's a big red flag. But sometimes it'll line up with Scripture at first because they're parroting. That's what PWC is, Polly Want a Cracker. They're parroting what they've been taught, videos they've watched. She parroted Brother Brian a lot. She parroted uh, Brother Peter Ruckman a lot. And... Um, she was a PWC. So at first, her testimony sounded good, but like I said, I started seeing signs of, hey, wait a second, this doesn't line up, that doesn't line up, how she's living her life. She's doing a 180 on her beliefs. First she said she believed this, now she's changing it. She's going through the Bible looking for loopholes to justify sin and everything. Um, so I kind of, and I don't know if this is exactly what I did in one of my teachings when I explained what is necessary for a good testimony. Um, and people, I hope they didn't take that in. I'm telling you how to do your testimony as far as the specifics. But I'm talking about the outline, what it needs to entail for a good testimony, a true, a good witness. First, your lost life. What you were like before you got saved. I was a sinner. I was on my way to hell. I was into this, that. I was in movies, TV shows, porn. I had no problem with alcohol, I looked like the world, I acted like the world, here's all a lot of the things I used to do, and I had to come broken, that's the next part, how you became broken, how you came to God saying enough is enough, dropping your self-righteousness, okay, that's when you get the chance to preach the gospel, that's what a good testimony is about, preaching the true gospel, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and call upon the name of the Lord to save you. Then God looks at your heart, and God does the saving. At that point, you move to the next part, the changed life. These are key parts that need to be in a good testimony. Your lost life, how you became broken and came to the Lord, how you got saved and was brought, and you get to present the true gospel, and how God changed your life afterwards. That is a good testimony. I think it's the best testimony you can have. And remember, the key in repentance is godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow. My ex-wife now had worldly sorrow. She would have sorrow because of her decisions and the consequences of her decisions. She didn't have godly sorrow. Okay. She didn't think her drinking was a problem. Nothing wrong with smoking. Uh, nothing wrong with getting high. Yeah, she only does it a little bit, and she'd hit me up. There's nothing wrong with having one glass of wine. There is a problem for her having one glass of wine, because she can't have one glass of wine. It's like me saying, I can play one little innocent video game that's not sinful. I can't do that. I start playing one game, I start playing another. Then I start playing another. I can't be around video games. Mm -hmm. uh, Romans 10.8. My printer's kind of screwing up some of the lines. Romans 10.8, if you have your King James Bible open. I hope you do. What, what, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Right here. I believe that um, profession, that give, someone giving their testimony, remember it says that whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Confessing. Confessing their lost life. Confessing their brokenness, repentance. Confessing their belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Uh, confessing their changed life. 
Okay, I believe God did this for a reason to help us point out false brethren. Okay. Second Corinthians eleven twenty six, Galatians two four talk about uh, Paul talks about false brethren. He was deceived by false brethren. Okay. They had all the right words to say, but out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Eventually, their true self is going to come out. It's just going to come out. Give me a second. There's some shade behind this chair. She can go sit in the shade. Shade. The sun's coming out with a vengeance. <laughs> it was kind of shaded, which is why I chose this spot. And this will probably be another new spot for my, if I ever get blessed. I just don't know if I'll be allowed to do ministry again. I screwed up royally. It's up to the Lord. Okay, Second Corinthians, yeah. False brethren. I believe the reason the testimony is important, brothers and sisters in Christ, is because that can determine to a point it's one of the signs of a true convert versus a false convert false brethren okay. then like we talked about the changed life when they talk about the changed life uh, you look at their life okay. and it's so hard because we're so spread out and it's long distance a lot of people find brothers and sisters in Christ long distance to fellowship with but they have to do it on Skype they have to do it with emails. Um, they do it through websites like uh, Brother Brian's got this website, uh, KingJamesVideoMinistries.org. You can go in there. They've got a lot of uh, Bible topics that people talk about. They've got a prayer request list where people can talk about prayer requests and get prayer. Um, but it's hard to see the changed life unless you're getting to see the person on a weekly to day-to-day -day basis, like weekly basis, when you're not dating, the word will come to me. Um, but you're proving yourself to her and she's proving herself to you. Uh, you get to see him up front. Second Corinthians 5.17 Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The key there is all. There's a lot of people out there that fight the changed life saying it doesn't have to happen. It says all things have become new. The changed life isn't just going from unbelief to belief. It's a physical change in your life. God is going to change your life. The old man, the way you used to be. Uh, there's a lot of things I looked up. I don't think I put them down in here where the Bible talks about the old man. Uh, before times, the old man was a liar. But you're not supposed to be a liar today. Before, you used to be like this. You used to be like that. You're not supposed to be like that. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. And here's Titus 1 through 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Uh, what we mentioned earlier, uh, part of the changed mind, uh, changed life, is it proves that you know God. If there's no change in your life, you didn't, you don't know God. Okay. Her testimony. I kind of skipped ahead, so we'll do both these parts. Her testimony started out that. Um, when I talked to her, oh yeah, God brought me to the Bible version issue a few years ago, and he's, he's doing this, and he's changed my life, and she's talked about the true gospel, and in my head, I should have gone in deeper and said, ask more questions, like just flat ask her, just give me your testimony. I thought, I took that as that's her testimony. You know, she came to a point in her life where she was broken, here's the true gospel, God brought her to the Bible version issue, and she's claimed to have a changed life. But after I started talking with her a little bit more, um, then she said, no, no, I got saved when I was, gosh, I can't remember, it was 10 or 12 years old. She got saved at a very young age. And then she talked to me about her life after she got saved. And I looked at her life after salvation. I'm like, but you looked like the world, acted like the world. Uh, you were doing some very sinful, wicked things that uh, the Bible condemns. I understand you struggle with sin afterwards, but you come to a broken state when you get saved. And you start reading God's Word, and you God says, okay, I'm going to show you. What you're doing right there is wrong. Now, what's your attitude towards that? That's what He did to me. What's your attitude towards that? That's got to go. And at first, and this is not a good reaction, because I said it before, I was like, oh man, that's got to go. And I, I had to smack, you know, kind of like you smack yourself upside the head and say, okay, no, nope, it's got to go. God says it's got to go, it's got to go. Okay, the changed life. I looked and her testimony changed. Then it would go back to, well, no, no, I could have gotten saved, 
you know, when God brought me to the Bible version issue. I went through all these different religions. But I got saved at 12, but I went through all these different religions, and it's like her testimony was a mess. If I'd have delved in deeper, I'd have known this. I'd have looked and said, hey, wait, something's not right. I didn't do that. Brothers and sisters in Christ that are looking for a good godly husband, a good godly wife, you look into it. You hammer them, okay? What's your testimony? What was your life like when you were lost? What's your life like now with the changed life that now that you're saved? Okay? Uh, so these are things to check for, and they're red flags. When their testimony changes a lot, and their testimony don't include those things. The changed life. The, the way their life was like before. They're not using the true gospel that I just mentioned. That's found in the King James Bible. Okay, these are red flags. Don't make the same mistake I did. The third thing, so the first thing is their testimony. Make sure their testimony is true. Two, she didn't have a changed life. She didn't. She still lived like the way she did before, partying and, and living like the world, looking like the world. The world loved her. The Bible says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enemy with God? Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God? She was a friend of the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Those two verses, when they apply to somebody, they're not going to have a changed life when, they're, when they fall under those two verses. Loving the world, being a friend of the world. They're not going to have a changed life like that. It's a sign of a false convert. Now, one of the biggest things she started doing after, Sal after we got married is she went from, okay, I agree with you, we're going to live by the Bible, and when the Bible says it's wrong, we're not going to have it in our house. Anything we find that's evil and wicked out of our house, we're not going to have uh, satanic-style satan music. Gone. We're not going to have movies and TV shows. We're just going to have old hymns. We're going to listen to the Bible. We're going to do good things with our hands. We're going to live a godly life. She's going to support the ministry. But like I said, she was happy when I had to step down from the ministry. A sign of, of a false convert and someone you don't want to marry is someone who justifies sin. After we got married, the signs were there. She started justifying sin. She started doing a 180. Like I said, she started justifying drinking alcohol but there was nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with getting drunk. Nothing wrong with smoking cigarettes, weed. Nothing wrong with bringing in these satanic style music. And I told him, uh, I don't know if your brother remembered, before things started falling downhill, I was asking brother on there, do you guys think that, um, I had it written down somewhere. Gosh, there was this worldly singer that I asked, do you guys think he's saved? He was hanging out with the Pope, Billy Graham, and I was like, he's lost. And you should have nothing to do with him or his music. And she cried about it. She cried about having to give up worldly music after she said she gave it up to begin with. Okay. James 5.16 Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The affectional, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Here it is, Johnny Cash. Do you think Johnny Cash is sick? Okay. Then she brought, I told you, she brought Lady Gaga into our home. So she justifies sin and I start seeing it and she was doing that a little bit before we got married. The signs were there. So you look at her, you look at him, whoever you're wanting to marry, and you make sure they're not justifying sin. When you catch them doing something wrong, and you quote scripture to them, what's their attitude towards sin? Are they justifying it? Or they have their head held down low like I do, catch me playing video games, uh, watching a TV show. Uh, you find something that's evil and wicked in my home, I'm like, oh Lord, I did not know this. Head held down low. Forgive me, Lord, and get that stuff out of your life. Okay. What's their attitude? Now, one thing I had to throw in here real quick on the justifying sin. Overcoming sin where you are. Some people say that if they can just get into a new environment, they can clean up their lives no problem. Okay? And I always like quote this from Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. 
if you're not struggling with sin, if they're not struggling with sin and fighting that sin and dealing with that sin where they are, present tense, present time, where they're living, where they are, changing environments isn't going to help. you got to be struggling with that sin where you're at. you got to be praying and letting Jesus overcome that sin where you are. Changing environments isn't going to help. And I think I fell into that trap of, okay, she's dealing with some bad things. The environment she was in back there wasn't good. And, and I, got, I got her out of that environment, put her into a godly environment, and guess what? It didn't change it. You don't tell yourself, well, maybe if I can get that person away from that, that they can change. It's not going to happen. They're either fighting it and struggling with it there, or they're going to end up bringing it here. It's still going to be there. Now, another thing that was a red flag as you're dealing with somebody that you're looking at as a Christian, but like I said, at this point of the study warning you what I went through the night day with tears, warning you not to make the mistake that I made. Okay. When things fall apart around them, where do they first turn? This was a big one for me that smacked me upside the head. Okay. I don't know if you guys know that old hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strange again in the light of His glory and grace. Okay, a sign that's, I think, uh, I have a sign framed up uh, in my house, and on that sign it has the word prayer in big capital letters, and in little letters it says, when life gets too hard to stand, kneel. And it's talking about who do you go to first. When life starts falling apart, who do you go to first? Do you turn to Jesus first, or do you turn to the world? Is your first response with what I went through, my response, when I fall into temptation, or things are getting tough for me, and things are falling apart for me, do I turn straight to movies, TV shows, and video games to hide? from the world and my problem? Or do I turn to Jesus Christ first? I still stumble, I still fall into it sometimes playing the little um, time waster games and that's what they are. They waste your time. They pull you away from the Lord. But is my first response turning to Jesus Christ? Okay? Now, uh, before we got married there were signs and I looked back and it smacked me upside the head. Sometimes she'd call me drunk and I didn't realize it. Or she'd call me high, call me while she is high, and I didn't realize it, and we would talk. And when things, when she went through struggles and things got stressful, she turned to alcohol in a heartbeat. Okay, she told me that when her, if her mom dies, and when her mom dies, she's getting drunk. She had no problem. That she wasn't like, I hope I don't get drunk. I'm gonna try not to get. No, I'm getting drunk. Like she didn't care. Um, her friend committed, uh, her closest friend committed suicide and she turned to alcohol, probably weed too, and she got drunk. Um, when, the, when, when you fail, fall into sin temptation, fall flat on your face, or the world gets tough and overbearing, the first person you should go to is Jesus Christ. I don't know if you remember that song also, What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Right. We're supposed to take things to God in prayer, and when you don't take things to God in prayer, you find yourself falling into that sin, and that sin pulls you away from God's Word. Then you realize you're not praying at all. You're not even reading God's Word. Okay? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You've got to go through Jesus Christ. Where do they first run to when things get tough? When they fall into trouble, the world gets tough, a friend dies on them, the world's overbearing, they lose their job, times get tough. Who do they first turn to? Do they turn to the world? Do they turn to their flesh? 
or do they turn to Jesus Christ? You can still struggle, you can still stumble, but when I fell into temptation, I fell flat on my face, I still went to Jesus Christ first and begged Him to help me, and I'm the one that failed Him. He didn't fail me. I failed Him. I didn't stay in His Word. I didn't stay in prayer. I went and turned and started playing some of those little games. Okay. When I first got saved and was struggling with this big time, because video games is a huge addiction. Every time I fell back into sin, it was my fault. But when I got tempted, I'd go to the Lord and say, Lord, don't let me do this. But when I did fall back in, I chose to do it. I failed the Lord. Okay. Two more left real quick. I know this is a long video for me just doing an update of what happened. So, um, how does the lost world react to him or her? It's hard to see that when you're trying to have uh, prove yourself to somebody long distance very hard to do that. How does the lost world react to him or her? I found out that the lost world loved my ex-wife. They loved her. Okay. They loved being around her. Oh, party time. She's great. She's amazing. She, Like I said, she would get in the truck and disappear at night and come back the next morning hungover or drunk. Okay. James 4.4 4, you, uh, we probably, let's see. 1 John 4, 5, They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. And we talked about John 4, 4, uh, friendship of the world is enmity with God. How does the lost world react to him? Right now, I have a brother in Christ that I talk to that's the only family member I have that I believe is saved, is my uncle. And I'll talk to him from time to time. But my family, I don't get along with my family. My daughter, I'll probably do a walk and talk talking about how my daughter and my relationship, my daughter isn't good because the world has her, its hands on my daughter. She's getting to the point where she doesn't want to be me. Cool music, cartoons. I, this home's a godly home. She comes out here. We do things with our hands. We work in the garden now that I'm starting to garden. We go to the beach. We have some um, board games. I had to throw out a lot of my chains for board games. But I have a couple board games that still seem to be okay until God shows me otherwise. Um, not my feelings and opinions. But we get to spend quality time together, but she's getting to the point where she doesn't want to be out here anymore. Why? Because she doesn't want anything to do with Jesus doesn't want anything to do with God's Word. I'll sit out on the deck and she'll be sitting out there playing on her phone and I'll start playing Alexander Scorvey, the Old Testament stories, and she'll get up and walk inside. She can't get to the point where she can't even stand to be around the Bible. Okay. How does the lost world react to them? Something you need to seriously look at before deciding to marry anyone. And the last thing it's the most trickiest. I believe that's how Apostle Paul was deceived. You have PWCs. To call them false brethren, he had to be deceived, and God showed him, hey, they're not true. Look at their actions. Look at their words. At first, PWC. Paul, you want a cracker. Parrots. They would parrot what other people were saying. Okay. Uh, Luke 6.45 A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil, for of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Okay? Eventually their true selves are going to come through. you got to be patient. I should have waited longer. you got to be patient. They might say all the right things. Okay? My ex-wife would parrot what Brother Brian taught and what Peter Ruckman taught. Okay? But then in the end, when it came to living it and obeying the Word of God, the stands they took, she didn't do that. Let's see. Matthew 12, 34 is talking about uh, being evil, speaking good things. But now that I look at the generation of vipers, he's talking to the Jewish people. Um, uh, Matthew 15, 8, These people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. I've always pushed in my teachings in the past, and I still stand by them. God looks at the heart. He looks at your heart. You can't hide from him. But those things which proceedeth out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defileth the man. But 
talks about what comes out, not what goes in. Okay? But that also will start coming true. At first, they'll parrot all these things. They'll say all these good things. You've always got to keep hitting them. Trust but verify. Keep talking to them about God's Word. Keep talking to them about what's right and wrong. And confront them when you see things not right in their lives and see what their attitude is. See what their words are. She started backpedaling. At first, yeah, I want to wear dresses. It's it's the apparel of women. I don't want to wear the apparel of men. And then afterwards, oh, it's just a lifestyle choice. Wearing dresses is just a lifestyle choice. She did a 180. Eventually, it came forward. It came through. Uh, a lot of other things she started doing a 180 on. Okay. Uh, yes, I want to obey my husband. I want my husband to be a head covering. And then afterwards, who are you to tell me what to do? I'm my own woman. I'm going to get my own car, my own job. I have my own money. I can have my own life beside my, like uh, another life on the side of my marriage. So I got my marriage life, and then I got my single life. I mean, everything she started doing a 180 on. Okay. So everything she parroted, her true self started coming through. Why did I do this video? Because brothers and sisters in Christ, I want you to understand why I stepped down to focus on my wife that I loved. I did love her. And I still pray for her. But I want to warn you, I went through... People like to say you went through hell. I didn't go through hell. That was nothing, nothing compared to hell. But I went through sheer terror. Nights where it just panic, my heart is just pounding, I'm laying there wondering if she's going to come knock down the door, if she's going to start a fight. Um, don't make the mistake I made. I might not be able to come back and do videos, I don't know. God will use me. He might not be able to use me. This experience is something I shouldn't have gone through because I screwed up. You don't have to go through this experience. That's why I'm warning you. You don't have to go through these experiences. Okay? Make sure you're marrying a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman. Depending on what you are, man or woman. Don't make the mistake I did and marry a lost person. It's never going to work out. Someone who's already married, they're both lost, and one gets saved. Either the other person, I believe this with all my heart, according to Scripture. Either one person, the other person is going to get saved, or it's going to end in divorce, going your separate ways. Why? Because you cannot, you'll have nothing, you'll start realizing you have nothing in common with the other person, and you won't have anything to do with the other person when they're living in sin. You won't condone the sin, and you won't participate in the sin. And you'll realize that you're getting farther away from each other. Either they're going to get saved, or you're going to end in divorce. So. This is my warning to the brothers and sisters in Christ out there. I screwed up. Um, I can really use your prayers. Uh, keep praying for her too. But um, don't make that mistake I did. Okay? I apologize to the brethren. I was supposed to help JT with his book that came out, like reading it for grammar and stuff like that. I apologize if you're watching this, JT. Uh, I screwed up. It's not JT does anymore, but he's got a new... Uh, to repentance, I think it is. Um, I failed you, and I'm sorry. Um, I've had people uh, that emailed me that I kind of tried to keep in contact with, but I just fell through the uh, prayer requests and stuff like that. I failed you guys. I was just, there's no justification for it. I would not have done that if I had married a lost woman. Well, I didn't marry a lost woman. Um, I love my brother and sister in Christ. I'll continue to pray for you, continue to pray for me, and what. God wants from me. Um, I don't know what the future holds. I'm still going to continue to leave gospel tracts everywhere in town, the ministry of reconciliation, Bible by the ocean side, uh, worship by the ocean side. I'm, I'm still wanting to do a little walk and talks here and there. But um, I just don't know what God wants from me at this point. Now notice this, I want to say this, this didn't all happen recently. Um, it's been four months since she t supposedly got remarried. And uh, yeah, about four months, and just trying to put my life back together, and, and actually let God put my life back together. Please, 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 with day and night with tears, and with letting you know the terror I went through. Don't make the same mistake I did. I love you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I will hopefully see you in a future video.